Hello, I'm Chris Hewitt and welcome to Game Shock TV, the gaming show that's just been on its summer holidays. How were your summer holidays, by the way? Yeah? Nah, it's not, I, I can't hear a word you're saying. This isn't a two-way thing. Anyway, this is what we got lined up on today's show. It bring out their big guns with the release of Rage. A potential console killer emerges, a new cloud gaming service on live. It's fanboy versus fanboy as Pro Evil tackles FIFA. Resistance measures his weapons against Gears of War and we highlight all the best new releases. The future, like Lee said of the Jeremy Kyle show, is a very scary place indeed. From Deus Ex to Fallout, games very rarely have anything good to say about the shape of things to come, with human DNA, the fashion industry, and yes, personal hygiene all getting a bad rap. But for gamers, the most notable casualty is originality, with many games cut from the same dystopian cloth. But new game Rage aims to change all that by painting post-apocalyptic mutants in a new and interesting light. But has it worked? Well, there's no time like the present to find out. Back in the 1990s, Dallas-based developer id Software pioneered the first-person shooter genre with such landmark titles as Doom and Quake, while also mirroring the Britpop trend for short one-word names like Blur, Oasis and Ocean Color Scene. Rage at least continues that sparse nomenclature, although the game itself, their first new franchise for about 15 years, represents something of a departure. Misleadingly billed as a first-person shooter, the reality is something of a hybrid that can loosely be described as a post-apocalyptic vehicular role-playing shooter, the bastard son of Fallout 3, Waterstorm Apocalypse, and even Red Dead Redemption. Awaken in some kind of survival pod, all of your colleagues are dead, as indeed you would be were you not rescued by a friendly passerby in a jeep. It's the beginning of a relationship in which he and other survivors send you out to do various jobs in return for money, weapons, and eventually vehicles, which can be entered into races for further rewards. While the Q word, quest, is never used, and there's no arbitrary XP, the structure is RPG light, with the jobs generally consisting of tight, violent gunplay, interspersed by on-wheel sections that are comparable in quality to bespoke driving games. Using Id's new proprietary Tech 5 engine, it's a graphical tour de force that throws up exceptional detail in the broken beauty of the admittedly cliched post-apocalyptic landscape. It's also a compelling story, much like a futuristic western, as you roam the badlands and wander the town as a mysterious stranger before ingratiating yourself with the locals, generally by running errands and slaughtering mutants. Weird and wonderful characters are commonplace, and there's a real sense of exploration with bizarre twists awaiting you along the way. It have also thrown up a surprise in the multiplayer, defying their shooter history with a commendable stab at online car combat. New franchises can often be a difficult sell, but Rage comes as a fully-fledged, graphically stunning epic that will presumably yield a slew of sequels. And if they could just sort out the bad guys' preposterous British accents, we'd all be a little bit less angry. You know, you may be forgiven for thinking that writing a shoot 'em up, for example, amounts to little more than copying and pasting a bunch of. But you know what? You'd be wrong. We spoke to one of the writers of the phenomenally successful Gears of War series to find out how to captivate millions and also get their top tips on writing for games. Turns out it's not just about sticking a bunch of noises in. Trust me out then. It's a fairly clear-cut distinction between novels where you control the pacing and the revelation uh, to a game where you don't know if that player is going to go through that one level, a certain route. You don't know if they're going to then put it down for six months. Uh, you don't know if they're going to watch the cines. There is so much that, that you can't rely on to tell your story. So you end up doing a certain amount of story redundancy in that you've got to say key plot points and make key points in cinematics, uh, in-game dialogue, chatter, the environment on the walls, everything, because you, you have to make sure they've picked up enough of the critical mass of the story to be driven forward and also to be motivated to play on, because you know, uh, the emotional engagement of the story plays a very, very large part in you know, the re building the tension and wanting to win. Most people, you can, you can draw very accurate uh, uh, pictures of them with, with the right sort of dialogue. One or two lines define people. I, I think it's a major myth to think you've got to have some enormously long navel-gazing thing to, to establish character. We make judgments about people based on very quick uh, things like eye, eye movement, body language. As animals, we make those decisions very quickly. You can recreate that in a game. I'm watching it on the, on the floor now. 
and I can see all the different things, the different gestures, the little things that, that build up a character. Even amongst huge, fairly generic muscle-bound hulks, you're saying that each one has different inflections? Absolutely, absolutely, and they, they all have different body movements. And it's a cumulative process. If you keep it consistent and you grow that character, then eventually people, people know that character and they know what's consistent for that character. And this is why in some games people say, well, so-and-so wouldn't do that. Because they've absorbed that. Um, Gears is very character driven, always has been. Don't let the muscles fool you, even on the women. Um, those are real people with real problems. The only normal one's Dom. I mean, even Marcus, who in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more ordinary shooter would just be an empty vessel. He's, he's, he doesn't say much, but that's, that's his character because it's all bottled up and you see it in these, in these sort of facial, facial movements. It's, it's, it's a great temptation when you're building a, a franchise to come up with a massive story bible like that and fill it all with facts and then try and regurgitate them and, and name all the battles and name all the dates and give all the captains names and actually not only does it miss the average human being you've got to make the feelings stick you're not bombarding them with facts doesn't work so Epic just said okay we're not going to fill in gaps uh, it gets filled in as it needs to be filled in with the story this is the vibe this is the feeling can you do that feeling for it I've tried to tell the truth in, in, in fiction. My, 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 my particular gold standard is I, I like to put, however big and chainsawed up they are, I like to put, portray soldiers as, as, as they are for real. <laughs> yeah, Tinker Toes, because you know bladder control ain't your strong suit. Once. It happened once, okay? Not the stereotypes of fiction, but real guys. And Gears, is, however big they are, they're basically ordinary guys faced with the most extraordinary events and rising to them, which is really the sort of the best you can hope of humanity. I hate to interrupt people, but we got visitors. Socrates, Einstein, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Every so often someone comes along who upsets the natural order of the universe just for the hell of it. The latest bolt from the blue comes in the form of game streaming service OnLive, who are hoping to give the big boys a kick in the virtual groin. But will their cloud gaming service reign supreme? Or is it lacking in substance? For these and more appalling meteorological puns, we send Steve Hill to find out. What we've done is make it so the video games, instead of running in your home at all, are running at a data center, uh, potentially a thousand miles away. And the uh, high performance servers there are able to run the games with much greater performance than you could possibly run at home. And then when you want to play that game, you just choose whatever device you like, whether it's a television, PC, Mac, tablet, um, soon Blu-ray players, and so on. And you just connect to the game and you play it. The games play instantly, they're compatible, you don't have to worry about obsolescence of your hardware, etc. But we've added a lot of other cool things, like we have this incredible community where you can actually watch people play live. And uh, you can make a what's called a brag clip video, a recording when you did something great. You can voice chat with other people. Uh, all the demos are free. You can demo any game and go crazy. So all that is, is free. Uh, then we have um, a, a really great flat rate subscription service. It gives you over, over 100 games. So any brand new games, um, they come out pretty much the same day and date um, as they come out on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 and PC. So actually with cloud gaming, you have a more secure, more robust system than you would um, with conventional gaming. Obviously much depends on the speed of your broadband connection. Try it on a laptop and three to five megabytes per second should do you nicely. But if you want to use the hardware console on your ludicrously sized flat screen, you'll need much greater oomph to get something more than an expensive slideshow. For while the system rightly prioritizes control lag, and in that sense, it's pretty tight, the same cannot always be said of video quality. On slower games such as Arkham Asylum, the picture is extremely crisp and mightily impressive, with only the occasional compression issue rearing its blocky head. Move to something like Dirt 3, however, and it begins to resemble footage shot on a 10-year-old camera phone with a splattered texture and stop-motion frame rate akin to watching a line of pensioners trying to dance the robot. Other online devices and even the time of day seem to have a wildly variable and unpredictable effect on performance as well. The game selection is currently limited to a few top titles, patted out by also rants that would struggle to be recognised at their own launch parties. That should change soon however, and the prospect of a monthly fee for unlimited gaming is undeniably enticing. The menu system is slick, the control pad bundled with the TV system is excellent, and it even supports Xbox controllers. With a decent connection and a spot more reliability, this could be a real contender. 
but as it currently stands, it's a great way of demoing games free and instantaneously, but still needs a bit more bang before it's worth its bucks. If football games were like commentators, and for the purposes of this tenuous analogy, let's assume they are, then FIFA would be a bit like the Sky Panel, smart, slick, and metaphorically at least, smashing it. Whereas Pro Evo would be a bit more like John Monson, limping along, well past his best, obsessed with stats, and smelling faintly of dead sheepskin. But with each new season comes new hope, new tactics, and new marketing spiel. And so we got both teams out on the pitch to see which one of them is going to be sick as a moon or over the parrot, Brian. Over to you now in the studio, Brian. Another year, another FIFA, and the frustrating merry-go-round of relearning skills you thought you'd already had begins again. This year, it's a turn of the defending system to make you look like a thumbless chimp, as charging down your opponent is jettisoned in favour of positional priority. While it initially makes you feel your back line are aimlessly running through treacle, what it actually encourages is a more team-based approach to shutting down the opposition, losing immediacy in favour of accuracy. It's one of several features of position FIFA 12 as the most serious and realistic version of the game around, and a change that's likely to divide gamers. Dribbling works a lot better, and the career mode too has had a neat little overhaul, with more emphasis paid to managing your players and their form. Action on the pitch itself is a pacing of a real game, for good or bad, and as usual, the commentary, sound and graphics are all top, top quality, even if some players still look like claymation rejects. Overall, it plays like a beautiful game, warts and all. For every moment of fluid passing and sublime net busting, there are dozens more where making a tackle itself will feel like a major victory, leaving FIFA feeling more like a simulation than a game. At one time the Arsene Fenger of football games to FIFA's mid-table strugglers, the tables have now turned, and it is the underdog Pro Evo offering a more immediate arcade experience. But compared to FIFA's latest tactics truck, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Hi John, I can tell you, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And indeed, after a series of mediocre outings blamed on the transition to new hardware, Pez would appear to have finally caught up, as the 2012 version plays an intense, expansive, occasionally thrilling game of association football. Unless you're using the Xbox control stick, in which case the man in the ball refuses to run in a straight line. Weirdly, there are no such problems using the D-pad or indeed the PS3 version. Game breaking bugs aside, there's plenty of open attacking football on offer, with the head in your hands Goma scrambles that once defined the franchise back in evidence. Whereas simply regaining possession can take half a match in FIFA, in Pez you can generally get a shot away, although actually scoring still requires some effort. And while the lack of licensed English clubs still grates, the Champions League is present and correct, and the online Master League is hugely compelling. Just don't call it a comeback. Of course, programs like this wouldn't be possible without advertising. Or, of course, tasty pizza. So while the commercial guys work the magic on you, I'm going to sit here and enjoy this bad boy. See you after the break. Mmm, tasty pizza. I don't have to eat it, do I?